Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me. I hope I won't bore you too much. Um, that's a great opening line, isn't it? Um, no, I, I'm a little bit nervous about tonight because it's about uh, it's supposed to be an expert session, and uh, you know I've been working for NIPJ for seven years, and I kind of concern my, consider myself at least a little bit of an expert for NIPJ. I've written two books about it, so maybe I've you know got a little bit of uh, of a background. But the topic that you invited us for uh, was all about uh, graph algorithms and machine learning. And if I'm completely honest, it's kind of new to me too, right? So um, I can show you a bunch of stuff, but if you go to ask me about how does, you know, the between this calculation of blah, blah, blah works, I'm going to say pass, right? So uh, just to set expectations, um, that's not where my area of expertise is. We have a lot of people at the that have that expertise, but I don't, I'm not one of them, right? So, um, but I can show you a bunch of things and I can introduce you to a bunch of topics and hopefully I can encourage you and stimulate you to explore uh, on your own afterwards. And then, you know, um, hopefully that will lead to further conversations after tonight. Okay, so that's, uh, that's kind of the, uh, the intention, right? So. Rick at Neo 4 j that's me. Um, I, you know, he was asking me, you know, so what do you do? And I, I don't know, I hang around and um, I actually am a salesperson. So I try to make Neo 4 j into a business, uh, which is uh, kind of an interesting task because obviously it started as an open source project in Malmö, Sweden with three guys uh, in a garage trying to scratch an itch, right? That's how it started in 2001, right? Back when 4J was still really hip, right? Uh, that's a long time ago. Um, but that's, that's how it all, it all started. I'm a salesperson, but I am a very fond believer in open source and uh, in open source business. Uh, I think you, you need a business in order to have real open source in the long run. Um, which is why I've always been active in the communities, which is why I do these types of things, which is why I write about it on my blog, which is why I've written the books, which is why I do the podcasts, which is why I don't have a social life, <laughs> right? So um, that's, uh, that's this. Uh, speaking of books, I have five copies of the new O'Reilly Graph Algorithms books, and they're going to go to the best questions. <laughs> Right, so if you have, uh, I don't want, uh, I don't want you to shut up. I don't want you to uh, be a long document. Um, I want you to be an interactive node that talks to me. And um, so, if you ask, have a question or a comment, then please speak up. And you know what? You might get a book. For everyone else, you can download this book for free. <laughs> right, so. Uh, uh, if you're like, you know, I don't want to carry that thing home, then, then you should shut up. You know? uh, that's basically the, the, the idea. All right, speaking of books, um, another reason why I wanted to do tonight's talk is because we've actually done some really great work this, uh, this spring. Uh, um, I don't know if you, you probably weren't there, but we did a meetup in Brussels a couple of weeks ago for Graph Celebration Day. And Graph Celebration Day was an initiative that we put out there to get as many community members together as we possibly could to celebrate this guy's birthday. And I'm hoping that you know who that is. Come on, you math heads. What's that? Leonard Euler, yeah. Leonard Euler, uh, founder of Graph Theory. And um, it was a fantastic event, a series of events. We had 81 different events on April 15th. Uh, all over the world. Uh, in, in Brussels and Amsterdam, we were a little bit late because it was Easter holidays on April 15th, and we, we did it in May, but uh, we still had a great time. And if you know Euler, then you also know this thing, right? The Seven Bridges of? Königsberg. What's, the, what's that? Kaliningrad. Ah, that was going to be my question. You know, what's the name of Königsberg today? It's Kaliningrad. Uh, and it's uh, in modern day Russia. And uh, how many bridges are left today? Oh, come on. Four, there's four bridges left today. Uh, they were all bombed to pieces uh, in the Second World War. Um, uh, but this is where it all started, right? Graph theory, right? Uh, 
you know the, the story? He, uh, about his problem in particular, yeah. I mean a little bit. I'm not prepared to give a presentation about it. <laughs> <laughs> does, does, every, does everyone know the story? No, no, no. Zero. two minutes. No, it's, it's an interesting story and I like telling it all the time because it illustrates very powerfully what's so nice about graphs, right? So this, this was the situation before Euler, right? The city map, right? The city map of this beautiful city called Königsberg and they had an emperor, the emperor of Prussia, who was coming to visit and who wanted to take a walk. And as you do as an emperor, you make silly demands. Right? He wanted to make a city demand, and he basically said, I want to walk across the city, I want to see every part of the city, but I don't want to walk any street twice. So the demand, he's an emperor, right? he can do that, right? They couldn't figure it out because they were looking at this map. So, you know, they were walking, 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 oh, I can't find the route, can't find the route. So they ended up calling up Switzerland and asking Euler for help. Euler comes to Königsberg and he says, fuck that, you know, I'm not even trying, right? I'm going to look at the data in a different way, right? And I'm going to simplify the data into the world's first graph, right? The world's first network. The world's first network represents four parts of the city, one, two, three, four, right? And seven connections, seven bridges, because he realizes that there's enough streets, all we need to worry about are the connections, the bridges, right? And then, so that's what the first thing he did, right? He chooses a different data model, right? This is 1736, by the way, right? He chooses a different data model, and then he's like, well, I'm a mathematician. I'm going to calculate how I can uh, have a solution to this problem, right? So that's the second thing he, he does. He decides to calculate with an algorithm, if there is a route from one of these nodes to another node, to the, to going through all of the nodes without going through a single bridge twice, right? And what was the algorithm? It's called counting. Counting. All you need to do is you need to count the number of edges. Because he realizes that when you start somewhere, you're going to walk off of that place. When you end somewhere, you're going to walk onto that place. But everyone in the middle, you're going to walk onto and off of. Right? So the first one can have an uneven number of edges. The last one can have an uneven number of edges. But the ones in the middle have to have an, an, an even number of edges. Right? So count with me. One, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. They are all uneven. There is no root. Right? Add another bridge, you're, you're golden. Add another landmass, you're also good. Right? But you know, there is no root. In this situation, there is no root. Choosing a different data model and applying an algorithm to it is what we grew up with at near for right? We decided to chuck those tables, right? We looked at the data in a different way. We choose the network model. We choose the graph model any time of the day, right? And we apply algorithms on it. That's why we write books about it, right? So um, I think I've actually now already done that, <laughs> the intro to near for j started in 2001. Um, a long way. We're a company of 300 people nowadays, uh, globally represented. Hello. Uh, lots of great customers, lots of open source customers. I would say growing 50-55% every year, uh, doing it not in the typical hockey stick way, but being very Swedish about it and uh, doing it, you know, confidently and, uh, and, and good. Right. It's been growing great. It's a fantastic company. Uh, and I think it's a little bit because of the perfect storm that's brewing between the volume of data that we see out there. Right? There's so much more data out there, but there's also an increasing interest in the connections, right? in the relationships between the data. Whether you're talking about networks of people, the social graph, 
business processes, supply chains, uh, um, telecom networks, uh, knowledge networks, you know, whatever it is. There's networks. There's a lot of networks out there. And, um, you know, storing networks as networks is usually a really good idea. Right. Um, graph. Databases is kind of a new uh, technology out there. Uh, new to, damn it. Uh, that's the problem with the Zoom. Uh, I quite tend to watch this guy. Yeah. All right. Um, graph databases, it's kind of a new category in the broader spectrum of uh, uh, big data technologies. Um, I think lots of people have been moving away from traditional database technologies for volume reasons. Right, they want more volume and they want to be able to not worry about volume. Um, I guess Neo4j, why the fuck is it doing that? Um, Neo4j is not so much about volume, it's much more about complexity. It's about you know changing your data model to think about it as a network, to work with it as a network, to run algorithms over it as a network, right? Which is why we pioneered this specific type of graph, right, which is the labeled property graph. Is everyone familiar with the label property graph? There's a book here. No, I'm not, you know, just, just say, you know, the label property graph is a particular kind of graph which consists of four fundamental building blocks, right? The first one and the most easy to understand, I guess, is the node, right? It's the node. Um, it's a person, a room, a computer, a phone, a microphone, a TV, a lamp, a, a something, right? An instance of an entity, right? It's not a group of entities, but right? it's one instance of an entity, which, you know, if you compare it with relational model, would compare it to, hello, who was the wrong? Yeah. That's how easy it is, guys. <laughs> Come on, you can do this. Um, that's a row, a row in a table. Right? Nodes represent instances of entities, right? And you can best compare them with a vector in the table, right? They have properties, right? So they have keys and values, right? Like columns. Right. But the nice thing about it is that not every node has to have the same number of uh, um, uh, keys and values. So you can have a person with name and surname, but if you only know the surname, they will not be a person. Right. And it will still be a valid person. So that, In that case, is the name and the surname a different node, or is it an entity that's linked to one specific node? You can go crazy. I like that question, actually. <laughs> I'm going to run out of uh, <laughs> books very quickly now. Um, well, uh, in, in principle, I would argue that it's going to be a node, one node with uh, one with two properties and another one with one property, right? But um, if you, in your fantastically innovative world, are doing first name research. I have no idea what that would mean, right? But you're doing research about first names. Then I would, I would argue that first names are such an important concept in your data model that you should reify it. You should make it into its own node, right? And then you would have a person node with first name Rick and last name Van Bruggen. You see what I'm saying? In most cases, you wouldn't do that, but I can very well imagine that from a modeling perspective, it would make all kinds of sense in your first name research lab to reify first names. But does that mean that a node or a set of nodes, they don't need to be, let's say, homogeneous? Uh, they can have different meanings, different kinds of concepts in Yeah, yeah in, uh, they can in the sense that if you don't apply constraints to it, if you don't apply any constraints to your nodes, like must have this attribute, then yes, right? they can actually have semantically different meanings. Right? If you are saying, you know, I need a person to have a name, right, or a birth date or whatever, 
then you can actually enforce greening, right? But it kind of depends. And in all cases, and this is an implementation detail of me for day, but in all cases, constraints are optional. Right? So in, in the A4J, we make a very big difference, which is counterintuitive for people coming from a relational database, database background. But in our mind, the model and the schema are two completely different concepts. Right? The model is whatever you conjure up, it's whatever you think. Right? The schema is what you enforce. Right? So that's, those are different concepts so you in many of our projects what we do is we do the model the model evolves you know, it, it actually changes a lot during your development cycle agile remember but when you get closer to production then you know you want to nail it down right you want to nail it down and you want to enforce constraints so those were the two easy concepts nodes and properties right relationships is what it's all about right Relationships provide links between nodes, right? Rick lives in Antwerp, right? He's married to Kathleen, has kids, blah, you know, you know what I mean? I, my relationships to the other in instances of entities out there are formalized and stored explicitly as part of the data model in this fundamental building block called a relationship. Age, as we sometimes call it as well. And they also have properties, keys and values. They can have weights, they can have, uh, you know, dates, you know, whatever it is, right? And this is, this is very different from other databases, right? The relationship, what, what would you compare it to? Rick lives in Antwerp. What would you compare it to? Or a shared ID. Uh, for a key, <laughs> almost, <laughs> almost. I mean, foreign key is very close to it, but it's actually using and executing and persisting the result of the join. That's who, who said that. This is why I wore my sneakers, you know. <laughs> um, no, it's it really, it's more than a foreign key. Yeah, it's just a separate thing. Yeah, well, I mean, it's using it and yeah. storing the result. Right? So literally, the join operation is what you are persisting as a relationship. Right? I have people, I have cities, I'm joining them together. That's what I'm storing as a relationship, explicitly as part of the data model. We're not going to get to the algorithms part at this rate, but uh, <laughs> that's okay. We'll, 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 we'll do that at some other point. Um, we'll, we'll accelerate, actually. So, uh, so they, um, relationships have types, right? Married to relationship. They also have properties, but the, the types are quite important, and they're always directed. Like they have a direction. Right? Which, is, uh, which is, I always explain it as the difference between love and marriage. Right? If I'm married to someone, that's actually an undirected relationship. Right? Because if I'm married to my wife, she, you know, she has no choice. You know, she's married to me. You know? But if I love my wife, that does not mean that. Right? So, um, but in neo 4 can you store it? It always has a direction. You can ignore direction at query type, but technically it always has a direction. And you also see a little bit of uh, different colors here. That's the fourth and last concept, very easy to understand. It's a label, right? It's a rubber stamp. This thing is a node. This, this thing is a person. This thing is a book. This thing is a, you know, it says something about the structure of the data. Yep. I, you know, I am, I'm spending a little bit, a little bit of time on that because otherwise what comes after it doesn't make sense, right? And then we kind of have to level the field. Neo4j is much more than just the core database these days, but I'm not going to go into that. There's algorithms, there's integration capabilities, there's visualization capabilities, you know, lots of stuff that uh, we've been developing around this to make Neo4j more valuable. Um, and that's led to a bunch of different use cases. You know, at the end of the day, Neo4j is a very generic piece of software. You can use it for whatever. 
Um, and you know, when, once once you start getting into it, you will find that you will start seeing networks everywhere. You know, it's very difficult to start to think in tables when you've seen the network. Um, and uh, but you know, that's not how big organizations buy software. So we've been really focusing on a number of use cases, right? Specific use cases where where people uh, see most value these days. Um, just a quick mention. Um, we're going to talk about a very specific data set later today, but if you really want to uh, have some proper fun, uh, you should look at some of the public data, data sets out there, like, for example, the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. All of those have been analyzed with Neo2j. Um, and of course, the first thing you want to do is check if you are in there. Uh, uh, that's what I should <laughs> <laughs> And there is a room. In there. Uh, but fortunately, it's not a person sitting on the street in South Africa. So, uh, um, but it's uh, it's fascinating data sets, and, and to be honest, really interesting um, capabilities in there. Because if you if you know, the way I kind of uh, try to help people understand it, they probably could have stored or exposed the Panama Papers in any other database. Not, not really an issue. But the questions you want to ask when you're dealing with offshore networks are very open questions right there. I call them hypothesis free, right? I don't want to make a hypothesis, right? When I'm trying to evaluate the connection between Vladimir Putin and Mossack Fonseca, no, no offense to Vladimir Putin fans, but you know, if you're trying to evaluate that link, right, you don't want to hypothesize about, you know, I think that he's connected like this, 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 this. No, no, there's too many combinations. Like you don't want to hypothesize. You just want to say, I've got Vlad, I've got Mossack Fonseca, show me how they're connected. Right? And that's a very different question. Right? Other databases you would have to hypothesize. And with Neo2j, you can just say, wow, show me. It's very different. And you can do that with lots of other things as well. I mean, my favorite, one of my favorite demos, which I'm not going to do today, I promise myself, I'm not going to do it today. Is about Belgian beers, right? I like this beer, I like that beer, show me how they're connected. Right? There's a very interesting tastings to be had that way. Uh, which database would that be based on? <laughs> which database would that be based on? I actually scraped it from Wikipedia. Huh. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there's, a, there's a Wikipedia page. Or, uh, I promised myself I'm not going to show you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was getting such a reputation when I was doing that demo. Uh, um, I'm not going to show you, but it's Wikipedia. It's basically it's, there's a table there with beer brands, alcohol percentages, breweries, beer types, and something else. And you can just load that into the table and you can run stupid queries, which you know, maybe that's why I don't have a social life, you know. Um, but Anyway, so lots of examples, uh, but we'll start getting into uh, some really interesting stuff here, All right? So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you kind of have a baseline now, you know, what are these graph things, right? What is a graph? What is a labeled property graph? Neo2j is a database, right? It's a, it's a storage engine for networks, right? Optimized for networks. Um, and now, obviously for the last part, you know, two years or so, we've been not just focused on how you get data in and get data out, but also how you analyze the data, right? And analyzing networks, analyzing graphs, there's people that have gotten Nobel Prizes for it. Um, it's, it's, it's one of the most interesting domains of math that I know, um, but you know, we've, we've implemented a bunch of them and we've we'll shown some of those to you today as well, because connections help you understand things better, they help you predict the future, and, and hopefully also prescribe uh, um, uh, different measures. And there's some examples here that I'd like to explain to you, um, you know, because a lot of problems that we see in, in, in modern day uh, technology are very much to network behavior, network effects, right? Um, we had a problem here in, in, uh, in, in, in Belgium a couple of years ago when um, a Belgian railway approached us and basically said, um, if we change a train from, um, uh, what's it called, 
um, uh, building uh, well, whatever. Uh, so platform one, uh, thank you. Uh, platform one to platform 13, not only do the, the both platforms and the training get affected, but the next trains get affected, the locks, you know, the switches get affected, and those effects can last for days. Right? If, I, if I don't take into account the network scope of a change, I can end up doing shit that really, really disturbs the network. Uh, a similar example with TomTom, you know, we had um, TomTom uh, makes maps, right? They have uh, lots of uh, people, lots of automated systems editing the map, but they also have 900 cartographers, people uh, editing maps. If you make an, a mistake in a map edit, right? like for example, you turn the direction of a route around, right? I, you, you, you make a simple mistake, you know, it's, a, it's one click, right? You can end up completely disconnecting parts of the, the map. They have a technical term for it. It's a car factory or car graveyard. Like the car factory you can drive away from and never return. The car graveyard you can drive to and good luck. Right? And, and, and it's so simple, you know, these effects make these changes that they can ripple through the network. Which is why we want to understand network behavior. There's things like cascading failures. I don't, I'm not sure if you've heard of this. This is an example of this is an example of a propagation pathway of what happens in a change in the network to the rest of the network. The classic example I would say is airline congestion. Right. So you you have a problem at GFK in New York. And all of a sudden, you see the delays build up. First at the East Coast, and it goes into the, mid the Midwest, and it goes, in it goes all the way across the continent. We have an example. I spoke to a guy last week in Amsterdam who is doing the same type of re research with electric vehicle charge points. Right? You have a charge point for an electric vehicle. If they blow it, uh, if, if, for example, a fuse blows up an electric, electric vehicle uh, charge point, it, it congests the electricity network to the next level up. And it can basically put Amsterdam out of lights. Right? So they, 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 these things propagate. Right? And you need to understand, or it helps to understand how they propagate to do something about that. Another interesting piece of research is around flow and dynamics. Right? If you're a telecom operator and you want to route a call from Belgium to, I don't know, US, right? I have many different routing choices that I need to make in a split second. Am I going to go under the ocean, over the ocean, through space? You know, how am I going to get there? All of these connections have different costs, right? We don't see that. We pay a flat fee, right? But all of these things have, um, uh, have, uh, real-world costs for the, the, um, the telecom operator, and they need to make those routing changes in new real, real time. So flow and dynamics options. This presentation was actually made by an American colleague of mine, uh, and I stole her slides. Uh, no, I borrowed her slides. <laughs> um, and guess what? She comes up with this reference. Blondel. Does anyone know Professor Blondel? From, uh, I think it's from Van uh, um, but he wrote a fantastic um, uh, set of papers around um, understanding groups in networks. Sorry, I'm, I'm constantly no, moving in your site, but uh, um, and they came up with this example. And these, the, the red ones and the green ones, what do they signify? They're uh, language groups in Belgium. Right? So they're Wallonians. Well, and Fl Flemish people, and um, what they were trying to understand, they analyzed a telecom network, they got a data set from a telecom network, in Belgium, I don't know which one, and they started to an an analyze the different groups. And guess what? You know, Flemish people call Flemish people, right? Walloon people call Fl Walloon people. And over here, there's a couple of guys, a handful of people that call both. Right? I'm not kidding. You think I'm kidding, but this is 
dead serious. This is fundamental. These are bridges, right? These are bridges between communities. Right? And we'll talk about that later when we talk about between this. These are the people that are, have a very, very important bridge function when you're trying to understand different communities in your network. I mean, this could, I, this, I could have said, uh, you know, these are milk products and these are, you know, uh, brick products. And there's a couple of milky bricks in the middle, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah. that up, but you understand what I'm saying? These things are domain independent. You can find them anywhere, right? And there's actually algorithms that will help you find those bridge points and do these types of analysis. We find that there's a lot of interest in it. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Leonard. Um, and a lot of critical mass building here. Um, part of which we feel is kind of fueled by the unfulfilled promises of big data. I mean, we have a lot of data these days, but no, no one really understands it. Uh, and so, you know, we're, we're kind of hoping that we can contribute to making sense of that data. And we probably don't need all of the big data. I, I, my, my refrigerator is constantly saying, it's five degrees, it's five degrees, it's five degrees. You know, I probably don't need to know all the five degrees, but it only becomes 10 degrees. Right? Uh, so there's uh, some, some, some interesting um, potential there. And we think there's new insights to be found, found, right? Insights that will allow commercial organizations to do, um, uh, you know, Better, uh, better selling or improving revenues or cutting costs, but there's also some fundamental, um, you know, academic research happening uh, that has no commercial implementations uh, uh, today uh, that really um, make a lot of sense. Um, one of the things that I, 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 a couple of months ago, I, I met a guy at the, in London who was doing um, cancer research, and you know. I don't know, you, everyone knows someone who's had cancer, right? So it's, uh, it's always touching people's hearts. Um, and that guy, he blew me away because he was telling me this story of how they're coming up with new kinds of treatments for uh, cancer treatments that are based on page rank. Does anyone, everyone know page rank? Page rank is, do, does everyone know web search before Google? Lycos and Alta Vista and, oh, and how it sucked, right? It was so bad. Uh, you know, the, the web was so small and you couldn't find anything, you know, it was so bad. And then Google comes up with this completely new paradigm of doing web search based on an algorithm which Sergey Brin and, and Larry Page developed, which is a graph algorithm, right? It's page rank. They rank the search results, not based on some keyword matching, but they rank it based on the connectedness of the pages. If your page has more connections, if it has more referrals incoming and outgoing, it will get ranked higher, right? Same with tumors, right? In tumors, you have cells. Cells can propagate, they can breathe metastasis. That's what kills people, right? The cells that have the most connections are really interesting for targeting your treatments. The ones that have one connection, well, fuck those, I don't care about those cells. But the ones that have a lot of connections and have a high page rank scores are the ones that I probably want to beam at or whatever I want to do with it. You know what I mean? So this, I'm hoping you're starting to understand that there's potential there's a lot of insights to be gained. Um, some of those insights are really all about, you know, scoring and metrics, right? So it's just, it's literally quite static, right? It's something that you do once and then you do something with it. But, you know, more and more, and again, I'm qualifying this because I'm absolutely no expert on this. You can iterate, on it. you can do it dynamically. You can do it more and more and more. You can put it into a big pipeline do all kinds of other analysis on it, and then hopefully get to intelligent systems that learn on themselves, right? Um, that's kind of uh, where we are at. So how do we do that? How do we run uh, graph analytics, uh, graph algorithms? Um, you are going to keep track of 
in a little bit. I will try yeah. watching, uh, but I, I should not take more than another 15 minutes on this. Uh, I should try at least. Uh, so graph analytics so far has been either um, extremely complicated, you know, with a lot of building blocks and a lot of different elements to it that you, you may recognize some of these uh, uh, buzz names over here, but you know, you, you required a lot of different pieces of technology and you would have to tie it all together. The alternative would be to give a call to Cray or, or someone like that and buy a $2 million piece of hardware. Right? That was the alternative. Cray supercomputers, right? You know Cray, they have a, a or they used to have because it's just been acquired, uh, but they used to have a, a division called YARC backwards, right? And what they sold were graph processing machines. Right? There was dedicated hardware to process graphs. And that's what the big telcos would use. So they would, they would spend $2 million on a machine like that, and it would you know, suck all, all of the air out of the room and process their graphs, right? Or you would have these terribly complicated uh, settings, right? With things like uh, graph X, uh, Jelly for Flink, uh, different types of uh, graph um, uh, toolkits over there. Uh, some of these things were extremely um, limited in terms of size. You know, I don't know if you've ever looked at things like Network X, uh, Python library, um, that actually does a really great job. Um, there's even a, what's it called, Node Excel. It's a, a plugin into uh, Microsoft Excel that allows you to do like graph processing. But guess what? It would be limited, right? If, it, if your network would be more than a couple of thousand nodes and edges, you would, you would get into trouble, right? Um, and I guess this is where, you know, we kind of want to um, uh, provide, uh, provide some, some options, some solutions, um, because the drawbacks are clear, right? So it's, all, it's all the different tools. It's the <coughs> ETL problem of, you know, I've got my data in a set of files now, but I need to convert it once or twice in order to do something with it, right? Or uh, I need to write it back in or whatever it is, right? And then scalability, you know, things usually got, were quite okay if you were thinking about doing um, social network analysis on small networks, but they would blow up when you do it on, on, on actual uh, social networks. Right. And so there's a bunch of examples here. Yeah, I'll give you these slides, right? But there's quite a number of really interesting examples of people that have started to use Neo4j for uh, graph analytics. And if I'm honest, that's how we got into it. We didn't like wake up one morning and say, oh, we're going to build an analytics tool set. No, we had a bunch of very smart users that built stuff on their own, showed it to us, talked at one of our conferences and then said, you know, maybe, maybe you should do more with that. You know, that's how we rolled into this. This is actually one of the, the original ones. I've put the, the blog post and, and, and John Swain's um, original uh, um, medium post on the, on the slide. I'll share the slides with you, you guys and then you can, yeah. you can show it to people, right? Uh, this is 2016 when John Swain was analyzing Brexit, right, before they voted in the referendum, right? And he would do all these anal analysis and try to understand the different communities in um, the, the Twitter, the Twitter universe talking about um, John Swain talked at one of our conferences and he showed us his pipeline. Right? This is what he did, right? He would have a Python script to collect all the tweets, put it onto a queue, right? Put it into MongoDB, export it into Neo4j, then run a bunch of R scripts on it, get the results from it and put those either in my SQL or in a graph ML file, right? Then he would visualize it and analyze it, right? That was his process, 2016, right? Maybe that's a good way of doing it, but we think we should be able to remove parts of that. We should make this a lot simpler. If we make it simpler, it will become a lot more accessible to a lot more people. Right. So you will still collect the tweets or collect the data from somewhere. You would still need to ingest it or treat it in some way, right? But why do you need more wouldn't be in the world? Well, uh, you know, I don't know why he specifically chose 
that, but, I, but I'm guessing it was related to data ingestion speed or data, data collection speed or something like that. I understood my SQL because Tabu plugs into understand. that. Yes, 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 yeah. No, I, I think the, the MongoDB, I don't know, you know, what, was he, what did you say? Oh, the full tweet. So what he did was, may I understand I this? No, I think what he did is he put the full tweet over here, right? So all the text and maybe even the images. Right, but he stored the relationships between the tweets in the J. Yeah. Right, so that kind of makes sense. But if I'm honest, there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to store the full tweet in J. You know, there's, you, you should be able to do that. It's not that, that, that tough of a piece of data, right? Um, so we think there's a lot of simplification that we can do there. And um, that's where we've been building and building and building and building. Um, so we've got, we've always had this database, right? Uh, it's strong for a number of years. I just learned that you were still on version 2.1. You all of you have to shame him for that. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I think I convinced him earlier that he, he will move away from it. Um, um, on, on top of the native graph database, you know, we, we use the term native here. I don't I, I kind of glanced over that earlier, but that property graph model that I talked about earlier, that's how we store things on disk, right? So there's literally no layer in between. There are no tables in between. There are no documents in between. There's nothing in between. Down to disk, it's a, it's a set of data elements with pointers that refer to one another, right? That's how Native J is made, right? And um, that's also why it, it can be, you know, for everything, but it can be stupid fast because it's a pointer chase. Everything becomes a pointer chase. Right? It's like you find one thing and it's a, Whoa! you go smooth like that because computers are really good at chasing pointers. Right. Can I ask one question? And you mentioned fastness; it would be quick. Is there a difference in a performance between the? Is it, there is an open source version, free version? Actually, free version, and there is a version that we need to pay. I know that. Uh, uh, yeah, I have order forms. I have order forms with. You. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> there are some additional features, for example, that routine protocol. But uh, in a, in a means of performance, are there some differences between the paid and the free? Version. There are, there are. I mean, the way it you should be think. Tested, the, the free version, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, and I wouldn't say that it's for everything that it's different, yeah. but the way to think about it, at least that's our intention, yeah. is that the community edition is feature complete and it's a full product and it's a great product for individual developers, right? So it will, it will work. It will, it will do everything you need it to do. Um, uh, the enterprise version is much more about enterprise deployment. It's about managing it, it's about running yeah, it. Yeah, that's about what making I, we needed for the whole production with the, uh, with the slow delay, with the little response time. Yeah, so, so, but it, it's, it's about performance, but it's also about manageability, it's all about security. It's all yeah, about really I'm not going to bore the rest of the meetup with that, but uh, let's talk about that, you know, and uh, yeah. again, you know, okay. I'm, I'm very happy to sell software, so. Uh, <laughs> Um, um, what I was trying to explain is that we have this native graph database, right? Um, and you know, graph databases, actually, when you think about it, they're not new, right? They're very, very old. Right? If you go and visit the Science Museum in London, you will see these huge computers uh, in that fill the room uh, of the British Postal Service, uh, Royal Mail. And guess what? They were graph processing machines. Right, so they, they calculate the routes right, of postal packages. Um, so, and they use graph structures internally. My dad, when he was selling software in the 70s, was selling CODASIL databases, right, network databases. Right, these things are not new. This thing is very new, right, the cipher, right, or what we hope to make into an ISO standard called GQL. Right, this is the graph query language. This is um, a declarative way for you to interact with graphs, right? And uh, the declarative piece of it is very important right? because it allows you to declare what you want and the database has to worry about getting it, right? That's opposite to an imperative way of dealing with data. Right? And 
imperative language will you will instruct the system how to get to the data and sometimes that's actually really efficient right but the declarative way is way more accessible to way more people that's what we learned from sql right? uh, in the old days you had to be a COBOL programmer to deal with code SL. now you can just you know do ascii art and it will it will be fine um, but we actually developed a bunch of imperative plugins to Neo4j called APOC procedures. This is our first foray into uh, graph algorithms. If you uh, played with Neo4j, you will see that there's a plugin uh, tab to it where you can actually um, get the APOC procedures. They do a lot of different things, but some of it is algorithm related. Uh, but they were not optimized, and now we've actually optimized them. So we've got the algo library. Later on, when, I, when we start to look at the data, at uh, data sets, we'll have an algo plugin, uh, which is you know all of the different uh, algorithms uh, that we have implemented, 35 of them today, um, that, you can, um, that you can play around with. But we also realize that not every algorithm is going to fit into Neo4j. Um, and that you probably want integrations with specific um, data science toolkits, right? We, we think there, we, we know and we understand that um, there, there are certain data sizes that the FPGA doesn't handle very well and that you need to actually distribute over a large number of machines. And um, that's what we do with uh, our analytic in, uh, analytics integrations, integrating with, with Spark, for example, as the, the main platform for us. You had a question, sir. Yeah, is there a difference uh, in performance between the imperative way of uh, getting the data or the declarative way of getting the data? Oh, yeah, there is, yeah. Uh, I mean, it's getting smaller. That difference is getting smaller um, because essentially, so the declarative uh, way of working, you declare what you want, yeah. and then the system has to interpret that, right? You don't have a telepathic interface yet. Right, so we have to understand what you want, and then we have to create a plan for it. We have to compile that plan. We have to run that plan, and we have to give, give back that data. Right? So there's a bunch of steps that need to happen, and every step it can go wrong. Right, um, so we've gotten a lot better at that. Like for example, the planning piece. Um, you know, we have a cost-based planner, which takes into account the costs of getting to the data. Um, um, and and it's, it's very smart. I would argue in many cases, in complex data models, it's going to be smarter than you, right? Because it knows more about the data, right? You, you know some parts of the data model exactly, but you don't necessarily know the entire data model and the cost data plan does, right? So in those cases, I would argue that the declarative way of working is actually much more interesting. However, <laughs> If you are going to optimize for one little thing that you need to do very, very, very quickly, then guess what? The imperative way is unbeatable. Because that's what we have to get to. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what the declarative way has to get to. And is there a way to do the imperative? In the oh, yeah, with, with the plugins. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can just you can write plugins for NPJ. And people love that. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, you know, you drop down to the appropriate level at the appropriate uh, um, uh, time. So you can, I mean, uh, it's, it's a Swiss Army knife. If you, you use the tool that you need at the right time. So I guess it's in Java that you have to write this plan? Yes, you do. Well, any JVM based language. Yeah, yeah it works in Scala as well. Yeah, it works in Scala as well. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, you, you essentially, you're going to call the low level API of NFJ. Right. This is, again, there's different flavors, uh, but, and that's going to give you all a lot more speed and control, you know, but with speed and control comes responsibility. <laughs> and so it, it, that, that it's, a, it's a balance, right? I hope you understand that. It's, just, it's very similar to what store procedures do on a databases. Right? You, you get a lot more power and, and speed, but you can fuck up a database in no time. The way it is, you know. Um, does that make sense? This landscape, yeah, I am hoping it does, right? So that's where that's where we're that's where we're going. That's where we're heading. Um, when it comes to the algorithms, um, these are the three main buckets that you will see, and it's expanding. 
but there's three main buckets of algorithms that Neo4j is actually really good at today. It's actually always been quite good at the pathfinding piece, right? I've got Vladimir Putin, I've got Mosaikon Seka, show me how they're connected. Essentially, what you're trying to find is a path between, right? Doesn't really, you don't really know what kind of path, but it is a path. Uh, sorry, I just because you mentioned that the database gets stored on this mm -hmm. as in its kind of native format, mm -hmm. but like, uh, but the only, and I'm not a graph theorist, so the only con context that I've encountered, like graphs properly, is like chemical structures, for example. And there it's usual to represent the chemical structure, for example, as an adjacency matrix. Mm -hmm. So, and as far as I remember, a lot of the algorithms that work, they work on the adjacency matrix. Is that something that that's a bit funny? No, an adjacency matrix yeah. is a different, is a mathematical representation yeah, 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 yeah. of the graph. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, the algorithms that are mathematical procedures, essentially. Yeah, I don't know the details of how they're implemented. Um, because the question is, you know, if you have to convert from the on this graph representation to an adjacency matrix every time to do a calculation on it. Is there a performance cost? There? No. Well, I mean, I think the, the so I, I don't think I know the okay. entire answer to your question. And I'm going to give a book because of that. You know. <laughs> uh, um, you don't the answer <laughs> no, it's not going well maybe it is, but uh, so so here's the thing, right? So um, I, I don't think we actually have to go back and forth to okay. use different representations. Why? Because we use this one particular trait that uh, eliminates that for us. Um, it's called index-free adjacency. Have you ever heard of that? I've only worked with adjacency matrix. Yeah, so index-free adjacency is the most expensive word that we could found, find to, to basically say that everything knows about its neighbor. Right, so when you store something in your J, uh, whether it's a node or a relationship or a property or label or whatever, it immediately knows what it's connected to. You cannot separate them. Right? So you do not have, you never have to go back to an index to look up what the next thing is. Right? So immediately, when I when I find something, when I find Vladimir, right, and I find I find Orval and I need to get to Duval, right? Uh, when I find Orval, I immediately know that it's a Trappist. When I find the Trappist, I immediately know that it's, you know, a brewed by a certain uh, brewery, right? You, know, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. It immediately knows that because they are locked together by point of structure. I mean, I can see the advantages of that immediately because in an adjacency matrix, you have to, you have to build a view sparse, sparse matrix yeah. encoding the entire thing. Whereas what you just said, you're an incremental. You don't need to do that, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's, there, I, I'm not smart enough to know the details of it, but uh, there's, there's, there's clearly that pointer structure is the secret source of why Neo4j is good at handling graphs. Because, you know, effectively you, you can just, reduce a whole bunch of problems by two point chains. Sorry, I don't want to push you, but... Yes. <laughs> I asked for it. Good man, good man, good man. Pathfinding algorithms, right? Then we have the centrality algorithms. That's the one that actually we, we saw earlier with Königsberg, right? Um, when we were counting the edges of a landmass, we were actually trying to determine the degree centrality of the landmass. Right? How important is a landmass? Right? The landmass with five bridges is probably more important than the one with three bridges. You see what I'm saying? Right? So that's, that's what we call centrality, and there's a lot of things, there's a lot of different ways of calculating centrality. Right? Page rank is another one. Right? When we were trying to assess the power of a tumor cell, Right? We're trying to evaluate the centrality of that human shell. Right? Uh, community detection is another one. That's the, the Walloon versus Flemish uh, uh, example, right? Where we're trying to figure out which parts of the graph resemble one another and how they fit together, how they form cliques, how they, found, how they form, they form um, uh, communities. 
right? These are the big buckets, right? And within, in each of these buckets, there are different uh, uh, ways of doing it. But usually, we will take a look at that. We will always use this way of, of, of calling the algorithms, right? We will call an algo.name, right? Uh, and then we have an optional thing called the stream, right? We can actually start streaming results back or we can wait for it and to finish and, 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 and see what's, what's left uh, after that, right? So those are the two variants. And then you give them a configuration parameters um, or graph parameters um, as, a, as, a, as a property of the, of the query. And then you yield something back, um, a node ID and a score. Uh, this is typically how it's going to work, right? You can also um, provide subgraphs as inputs to an algo, right? So you can say, okay, I'm going to run a cipher query, right? Inside of my algo, that cipher query is going to give me a result set, a subgraph, and I'm going to run the algorithm over that subgraph. Right? So those are, those are cipher projections that you can use. So centrality algorithms, um, page rank, we already talked about that, right? So this is an iterative algorithm. Google has hundreds of thousands of machines running them permanently, you know, boiling the ocean um, to literally assess, you know, how important and, and is it evolving uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the connectedness between different web pages, but you can run that very quickly you know, once, you know, a number of iterations on any kind of data set. Between the you know, the Walloons and the Flemish people that actually talk to both communities, those guys are very between, right? Closeness, they are very uh, uh, related to one another. And then the simplest one is uh, degree, the number of connections. These are some of the uh, community detection algorithms. And um, Belgium actually has a quite a, quite a history uh, on this, the Louvain algorithm was clearly uh, developed over here, and the Louvain en Neuve, I believe. Um, but it's uh, it's uh, it's one of the most uh, most powerful um, algorithms for community detection, um, pathfinding, shortest path algorithms. Um, you have um, a couple of Dutch algorithms that uh, provide you weighted of, uh, weighted shortest path. Uh, cost-based paths, um, breadth-first search, uh, depth-first search. And the idea always is, you know, that we want to provide you fast access to these algorithms that you can iterate quickly. You can run them once and then, and then uh, um, you know, try it again and again and again uh, very, very quickly after that. So this is uh, the time where, you know, I've, I've included a bunch of slides here with examples. For the interest of time, I think, I think we probably want to spin up your laptops and see if you uh, want to follow along with that. Um, oh, sorry, I have to go. Of course, have fun. Yep. Right. Um, again, right, so if you, I hope you have downloaded uh, either near for j desktop or created a sandbox for you. And the data set that we're going to be playing around with is the graph of Thrones, right? Um, this the the graph of thrones is actually I need to go. I'll include all these slides in 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 uh, the um, handouts, right? But this is actually what we want just to start with. Um, actually, I, have you guys um, got the Neo4j desktop? Yes. Yeah? I'm going to do that first, uh, and then the people with, uh, with uh, a sandbox can follow on later. So what you should do is you should have uh, one graph here. You add a graph, a local graph. You give it some Password. word. 
So what uh, the graph of thrones, what is the graph of thrones? It's, uh, it's actually an academic piece of research. Um, this guy that is getting his PhD based on this, I don't know. Um, and he's basically um, analyzing the interactions between characters, right? So Graph of Thrones is not just a, Game of Thrones is not just a, a, a TV series, it's also a series of books. Um, and he's basically put all of the, those books into, uh, into one, some, some big NLP thing. And he has said that, you know, if I've got a name appearing within 10 words of another name, and those two interact, right? So character one interacts with character two, right? Based on the proximity of their names in the book, right? And that's what we're going to be looking at. So you need to start, uh, oh, wait, 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 oh, damn it. Um, you actually need to go over here first. And uh, obviously I've done this wrong. You need to go into the plugins part of um, uh, the, the instance, right? And you need to install the APOC in, in instant, um, uh, uh, plugins and the graph algorithms plugin, right? So you need to have both of these installed, right? So once we've got that, I'm going to kick this guy out. And we can start our instance, right? And the one thing that you should also do is here at the top, you can either add an application and you should choose the graph algorithms play playground, right? Um, this graph algorithm playground is what we call a graph app. You can actually find all of them from over here, install that graph app, right? So you can click them here and install them into the desktop really easily. But um, you can also do it from what I just show you. Uh, you add an application and you should see this thing here at the top, right? This is what we call Neuler. We've always been great at naming things. Um, this is the graph algorithms playground. It's essentially a GUI on top of the algo library. Right? The plugin that we just installed, there's a GUI on top of it. And that's what you're, that's what you're looking, here, looking at here. Now your running instance is still empty at this point in time, which is why we are going to use Neuler and upload the uh, Graph of Thrones data set. We do that by do clicking here at the bottom, database icon, icon, and then you can load the data set. What this is going to do is it's going to run three queries. Right? Very simply put, the first one is it creates a constraint, it creates an index, right? It creates an index on the characters right, and the IDs of those characters, right, and it assures that the characters are unique. That's the first query. The second query is, yeah, if you know your cipher, it's a little bit more complicated, but not that much more complicated, is basically seven different load CSV queries. Load CSV is a cipher functionality that pulls a CSV file from somewhere any URL could be local or wherever, right? Uh, and it uh, um, works with those CSVs as rows and columns, and it allows you to manipulate those rows and columns and um, transform them into graphs. Right? That's what uh, load CSV does. The first statement is basically unwind. That means you know you're going to do it seven times. Right, then you've got to say, uh, because there's seven seasons, basically, right? That's, that's all, that, all this is doing, seven CSV files. At the core here, what it's doing is, it's creating the characters. Merge means I'm going to see if the character already exists, right? 
If it doesn't exist, I'm going to create it. If it already exists, I'm going to leave it alone. Right, so it's, uh, it's going to run through those CSVs, look at all the character names, and do the merge statement on top of it. Right, so that's what it does with the characters. The, sec the, the third query over here is going to connect the characters with interact season relationships. There's going to be different interact season relationships for different seasons. Right? It's going to be interact season one, interact season two, interact season one, until seven types of relationships. Right? That's, that's what these queries do. Yes, load it. Right? You can click that and it's going to be running. I already have the data set in here in my database, but because it's merge, I don't need to worry about it. Right? It's just going to say, oh, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. Right? It's not going to do anything uh, particular. Right? And you know, if I go back to my database here, right, um, I still got 400 nodes and 3,500 relationships. Is this working out for everyone? Am I, are, you, are you able to follow me? Am I talking bullshit? Okay, yeah. I still have one book, by the way, just saying. Um, actually, you can interact with this database by going to, into your Neo4j browser, right? The Neo4j browser is where you can run queries, right? So if I uh, just want to take a look here, I've got characters, right? And I've got the different season, interact season relationships, right? And every time I run one of these queries, or if I, if I click over here, essentially what's happening is it creates a cipher statement, right? Match, and then I for a, an N colon character, I'm looking for a character, return N and limit it to 25, give me back 25 characters, right? So you can see that the loading has succeeded. Right? I've got the data in my data set. Uh, so now I can uh, go back to not right easy enough so far so good yep how is it for the sandbox oh yeah so on in the sandbox the data has already been loaded right and in the sandbox you can actually not use noiler you cannot unless you connect to it from you in your in your, um, uh, you can actually connect to, I didn't try that, I should have tried that. The, in your, in your uh, sandbox, you got a connection string, didn't you? Uh, yeah, but I didn't find uh, it's a lot of strings, um, sandbox I found. Oh, no, 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 you, no, that, that then, you, then you did something wrong. Let me try and help you. Uh, so when you, when you, um, have your sandbox. So here at the top, the graph file, uh, so you do, you do start now, you need to log in, right? And then uh, it's, it says all kinds of different things. Um, where is the... The graph algorithm. Yeah. It's the one at the top. It's the one at the top, right? Yeah. Okay. So it's, it's, you have to it's this one. Yeah, it's that one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, and so that should have it yeah, in it there. Yeah, it only has the first four or five seasons, I think. Yes. Is it okay? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, What's that? Yeah, on the desktop, you will have until season, season seven. You could actually um, try, I don't know if it works. I, I think it's actually read-only. Um, so on, on the um, um, sandbox version, you will see that it runs this play, uh, colon play, and then guides.neofj.com slash sandbox slash graph algorithms. 
and that will take you through many of the same steps that I'm going to show you in uh, in uh, in Neuler as well. Actually, why don't we the the people that have the desktop version, maybe you can do this. So play colon play https colon slash slash guides dot neo4j.com slash sandbox slash graph dash algorithms. The people with the desktop should be able to access that just as nicely. Yeah. So over here, colon play and then the URL. HTTPS colon slash slash forward slash guides dot neo4j dot com forward slash sandbox forward slash graph dash algorithms. I'm sorry, I'm making this complicated. Actually, a conceptual sort of question. Yes. So you, you have the relationships just encoded, and in the relationship you just encoded which season, and then you can see they also uh, interacted with this. But like in my mind, would it not be a more logical way of storing it if you have also a separate graph of seasons, you know, season one, just follow season two, season three? And yeah. then in, in every season, we would have a sort of a subgraph. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? Like another dimension, basically. You don't have something to draw, right? I, you know, this is where we can get very philosophical, right? Because you can model this in so many different ways. And it depends on what you're trying to but do. But is it possible to do that? Of course it's a multi dimensional yeah. thing here. Yeah, yeah. So well, I mean, we only talked about like a single, like one structure. So, so right now I have character interacts with character, yeah, yeah. right? And and actually for many of the algorithms, that is a very nice and simple data model that you can do a lot with. Right? Um, but you can actually very easily see that if my research, right, we're not talking about uh, uh, first name research anymore, right? But if my research is going to be about um, about specific episodes or specific uh, uh, parts, then I want the interactions to become an entity, right? So then my model would be completely different. I would have character, character, interaction, right? Interaction between two characters, and the interaction would be related to a C. Okay, okay. Right, so I can blow this up depending on what I want to do. And I think the nice thing about it is that I can actually, if I was, I wish I had a drawing board, but it's not, it's not the case. I can have both of those models in my database at the same time. I can have this data model. Character interacts with character. Because they're different representations of the Well, it's just another way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Right. It's another pointer switch. Yeah. Okay. Right? So I can have character interact with character, but at the same time, I can have character part of interaction, part of season with other characters. Have a drawing board. It, well, uh, graphs are so nice to draw. Uh, that's also what I find. Because about. I was thinking the same with your first example was like a person, and like, you know, a person can be an employee, for example, as yeah, a person. Yeah. So that's also yeah. another graph. <laughs> yeah, but, but I think what we, what we, some of the algorithms that we'll be running, if we run on this thing, are much easier to run if you don't complicate the model. Okay, yeah, so a single Yeah, so you create a single language. Uh, having said that, in the database, you can perfectly have multiple models. Yeah, so. Does it mean that, you can, that there is no real distinction between edge and nodes and that you can switch to dual graph like instances? Or how do you manage those? Oh, not, in, not, not instantly. You know that? You know, if you, if you decide to have more than one model in your database, uh, okay. then you're going to be responsible for maintaining it. Are there things that you can do with edges that you can't do with nodes? Uh, node in reverse. There are things that you can do with nodes that you cannot do with edges. More specifically, indexing. So it's quite, it's, it's, you know, it's very common to rewrite the relationship. 
if the concept that the relationship represents, um, if the concept that the relationship represents becomes important in your domain, then you would need by it and move it into a node. Right, so, oh, I'm going to get messy now. Um, so, you, 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 I think you got what I said, right? So, character one, character two, right? And this is interacts, right? Uh, but I can, I can say, okay, I have an interaction. There should be a law against keeping bad markers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, right? So, and here I say in, interaction in season one, right? But I could say, just as easily say that this interaction is part of season one. That, that's what I'm saying, right? And, and I, you know, the, the example that I often give to people is, um, you know, when you're, when you're modeling, um, for example, family relationships, right? So uh, you have mama and papa, right? And they're in a relationship. I could say they are related, but no, I'm going to reify it and put it into a relationship, right? I could say, okay, mama and papa have kids, right? I could say mama and papa have kid one, and kid two, right? Right? Or I can say this, right? Because maybe Papa has another mama, right? It, 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 it depends on what you want to do. What is the best relationship, right? So if I want to query this data set about relationships, then I need the richer version of that model. But sometimes I just want to know who my daddy is. <laughs> it's true, right? And so then the simpler version of the data model is just as nice. It depends on what you're asking. Well, yeah, I, I can see how this is really messy to maintain several, several views on it at the same time. Yeah. With freedom comes responsibility. Yeah. Right. So um, I thought I was going to talk about algorithms. But this is, this is, this is, I think it's one of the nicest things about the ABJ, but it's also one of the most complicating things of the ABJ. It's that you have a lot of freedom. Just doing this. Yeah, if you want to, actually, what we do with it is that um, every different project that we do, we just make a new database. Because although they all kind of fit with the same logic and you could put them in one big database, it's just too messy. But aren't you in the last century, then? <laughs> yeah. No, I'm just following your direction to shame. <laughs> you already have a book, so <laughs> I'm not doing that. <laughs> All right. So if you play this guide, then you can play, then you can follow along here, right? And then we can go and look at Neuler a little bit later. Right, so it's a graph about character interactions. It's not 10 words, it's 15 words. I got that wrong, right? Um, and um, this, this guide, actually you, what you should do is you should pin the guide to the top, right? So it, the, the results come underneath it, right? So for example, if you do this, right, you do, we call the DB schema. Uh, if you do console enter, or you click the play button here, it runs the query and it shows you the schema of the database, right? Super simple, right? Um, um, and then you can continue here with some very simple um, cipher examples, right? So some summary statistics. Uh, now, Neo4j is not really made for these types of averages and maximums and minimums. If that's not what it's really good at but it knows how to do it. You know, aggregates are, are, are very well maintained uh, inside Neo4j. Um, this is actually an interesting one, the di diameter of a network, right? So uh, if you have a longer query that doesn't fit, you just push escape and you get the bigger uh, uh, query view. So what are, what are we doing here? The di di diameter of a network, right? the maximum number of shortest path between two numbers, right? So I'm matching two characters, whatever two characters, right? I 
I'm looking at all the characters, there's 400 of them, and I'm walking all of these paths between A and B for a particular season, <laughs> right, for season two, right? And then I'm looking at the length of those paths. This looks very innocent, but it's actually a really heavy query, right? because you have to run everywhere. Like you, 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 you're doing all the permutations. And then you're looking at the length of every permutation and you're ranking them. So you can't get by by making an estimate. You have to do all of them, right? So it's actually quite a, quite an, quite a heavy query this is. And this will give you the diameter of the network. Uh, um, I have no idea what's going to happen now. My machine might start fuming. No, it doesn't, right? So that's the diameter of the network. It, it gives you a feeling for, you know, the the expansiveness of the of the of the network. Um, you know, pivotal nodes. Um, what does this one do? Wait, just let me see here. Um, yeah, all the shortest paths between two other nodes in the network. We can find pivotal nodes in the network, right? If it lies on the, both of the shortest paths, right? Those are the pivotal nodes. So you have to do that in multiple steps, which is what they're doing here in this query. Uh, I don't know if you, you, you're familiar with this, but this is something that you have with other, other query languages as well. It's a way of passing results from one query to the next, right? This happens quite often, you know, you use with for that, right? So you run a query here at the top, Right, A and B, then you do all the shortest paths in, in, in season one, and then you collect them together, right? You collect the paths A and B, and you pass that on to the next query, right? So you, that's how you can do like multiple steps, uh, one after the other, and this is how, it, how they calculate those, uh, those pivotal nodes, right? This is all still pure cipher-based. There's, there's nothing algo about this. It's just cipher and what cipher can do for you, right? Now we're getting into the algo world, right? Between the centrality, right? And this is where you will find, so there's an explanation on the previous one, right? But this is how it works, right? I'm going to call an imperative algorithm, right? I'm not going to ask cipher to figure it out for me. I'm going to call an, uh, an algorithm based on the plugin, the algo plugin that we've installed, algo.betweenness. It's the betweenness calculation algorithm. I'm going to stream out the results. I'm not going to wait for it to fully complete, right? Between character nodes and over the interacts season one um, uh, uh, relationships. I'm going to do it in both directions. Right? It doesn't matter what the direction of the arrow is. If there's a connection between two characters, I'm going to count that. I'm going to use that. And then I'm going to yield the node ID, which is the identifier of node, and its centrality score, which is the between the score. Right? Then I'm going to look up that character where the ID is actually that node ID. I'm going to return its name and centrality and order it and return it. This is how those uh, algorithms uh, uh, work, right? It's, it's super simple. And I'm hoping you saw that it's actually super fast. 110 milliseconds or 18 milliseconds, right? What I find fascinating about this is that I have never watched a single episode of Game of Thrones, right? Uh, and I, I immediately know which characters are interesting. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know which ones survived. <laughs> <laughs> I could not tell you. Maybe. <laughs> right? Uh, well, I find that interesting. I have no idea about this, this show. I've never watched it. I don't want to watch it. But um, uh, it immediately gives me some clues. Right? Uh, but so those yep. algorithms, they are um, written in, not in the cipher. Uh, They're written in Java. Um, written in Java. So 
I should have maybe shown you two more slides. Um, so what we do with the algo library is um, we actually figured out a way to do this in a, in a very um, scalable and performant way um, by doing this, right, so the implementation. So we load the data from the FJ. Right? We actually store it in memory. We store it in a memory structure in, inside the FJ, inside the machine that runs the FJ. Then we run all of the graph algorithms in parallel Parallelized, you know, if you have 120 cores, you can do it on 120 threads at the same time um, on that optimized memory structure. Right? When we get the results from that, we write the data back in parallel. Right? So this is not Cypher doing that, right? This is a Java plugin, part of the algo package that does this for you. Uh, does that make sense? You say it's, it's parallelized, but how can it's parallelized algorithm by algorithm? Or did you find a way to have like one algorithm and parallelize it? No, it's every algorithm is different because their implementations. Some some of them you cannot par parallelize, so <coughs> because you need the results of the previous step for the next step. So yeah, you, because it's a network that you cannot cut in pieces. You know? No, you can't. No. So it, it's uh, some. Some of those things will still take quite some time, right? I think the whole the whole point, or a big point at least, in what we what we found is that the fact that you can already work with the network as a network, you can suck, suck it up as a network, and you can work with it as a network immediately without having to do all of the transformations is a huge time saver. And in, because then you need to load it into one memory space, right? Yes. What are then the limitations? Imagine you work on a on a telco network of a customer that has sixty million customers and you want to create a network with all of the customers, that's not an issue. You need a big, bigger piece of, piece of hardware? No, but I mean, 60 million records, that's nothing. That's, I mean, I can do that on my laptop. That's not a I mean, big deal. I've done, I've done this before, in, like, not with, with, a, with a graph database, but then yeah. you create a sparse matrix of 60 million by 60 million. That doesn't fit anymore in like an eight gigabyte. No, but that's not that's what we were talking about earlier, right? You don't need that. You don't need that anymore. But okay, but still, you have a certain within the limits of the of the hardware, right? If you cannot parallelize it. Yeah. Well, I mean. But you like the subquery things that you showed just earlier, like where you could just sample the algorithm with subquery. If you know already that you're just gonna analyze a part of the algorithm. Yeah. You. I mean. Y yes, you can. Um, but I mean. I, 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 I really think that the, the, there's very few things that we cannot solve with bigger hardware. Okay. You know, it's, 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 it's uh, you know, you're right. I, I, I'm not going to try and, 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 and uh, fool you in any way. When you run an EFRJ query, it runs on the machine that runs the EFRJ, yeah. right? And it does, does not get parallelized. It does not get distributed. It runs on that machine. We've just, seen in many very many practical examples that it be, it's very very rare that you need everything um, in the graph for example right so if you're talking about the 60 million records you know maybe we don't need all, all of the data records in the graph right or, or if we need all of the data records then we need, maybe we don't need don't need all of the fields Right. And again, sorry, one more point. I think 60 million records is not a big, it's a nice graph, but it's not a big graph. And when, you, when you give the example of the recommendation engine for Walmart, I can imagine it's about lots of, lots of customers mm -hmm. that buy similar lots of items, in fact, it's 40K different items that they have in store. So in, in total, that must give like a, an immense amount of data that you need to load. Yeah, but you don't, I mean, so for not, how do I explain that? Um, these algorithms don't always need all the data for them to run, right? Like for example, PageRank, at any iteration of PageRank, you only need two nodes, yeah. right? I just need to be able to look up two nodes very, very quickly, run the path and store the result, right? So I, I, I you understand what I'm saying? I don't need to store everything in memory all the time. I really don't. Right. This is what we call graph locality. 
right? We, we work with local parts of the graph, usually. Like we don't need everything. And we just, you know, it's and that's also why it's a, it's a real time algorithm because you have one customer and from that moment you take all of these connections and that's the only thing you're interested Totally, in. right. There are things, I mean, I, I don't want to hide this, right? It's a, um, we, we haven't gotten to it. Like between this is also kind of a, it's a, it's a local algorithm, right? Because you're always looking at two, two parts of the graph and you're trying to fig figure out, you know, how between they are to the rest of the graph, right? Um, Community detection is the big exception in my book, because for, for you to understand communities, you actually need the entire graph. Right? You, can't, you cannot say, I'm, all, I'm going to look for communities, but I'm, also, oh, but I'm going to cut this part of the graph off and only look at that part to, to figure out what the communities are. That doesn't work. Right? So you need to be graph global. Right? And, I, that does sometimes present a problem for Neo4j. And that's why we have, you know, I showed you a slide earlier where we have these integration integrations with Spark. That's why we have those, right? Because for some, some workloads, from, for some workloads, we need to be able to integrate with some distributed computing platform that allows you to, to do it uh, on X number of machines. So what I'm trying to convey to you is that that's the exception. That's the exception. Sorry. It's uh, nearly nine. Um, let's go on to nine. I mean, if you guys are up, you can stay here. Well, maybe not because you have some things to go. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe go on to nine and then that's the we cut it there. And, uh, yeah, well, I mean, I, 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 so the, I, I will speed up. Okay. So give me, give me, give me a couple more moments. Um, but um, where was I? This thing here. Right, so you, uh, yeah, okay. Um, if you follow this guide, there's actually a bunch of other algorithms that you can run in, in here. And all the time, what you see is the query that's being run, right? So you constantly, you look for these queries, right? Um, right? So for example, here, there's a page rank being calculated. You click on that thing, it puts the, the query at the top, you run it, and you, you get the results, right? So this is the bare bones graph algorithms uh, exposure that you get as part of Neo4j plus the algo plugins. Yep. What I do want to show people before we adjourn is the UI that we have on top of this, which is Neuler, right? Because Neuler gives you a, it's basically a, a way to, to around with this, visualize results, not just for the graph, um, the graph of thrones, you can apply this to any data set, right? So if you've got another uh, Neo4j database, you've got the Algos uh, plugin installed, you fire up Al uh, Neuler, you can run that on top of your own data set, right? And it literally does what we've been seeing in the, in the guide, in the step-by-step -step, uh, guide that we saw earlier. Like for example, here we have centrality algorithms, right? So if I want to calculate the betweenness, I go over here and I say, okay, I want to calculate betweenness between characters of season one in any direction. I want eight concurrent uh, uh, threads and I want, to want you to show me uh, 50 results, right? Here I have an option to store the results, right? So Neuler writes it back to the character node creates a betweenness property and writes down the score of that character into the node, right? That's a possibility, but you don't have to do that. When you run this, you see on the right-hand side, different ways of looking at that, right? Here's the query. The code tab at the top is exactly the query that we saw, that we saw in the earlier um, uh, guide. Right? It's exactly the same thing, right? The only difference is this part at the top, right? Where you create parameters, right? Performance tip, Neo4j loves parameters, right? That query planner, that declarative query planner that we talked about earlier, if you parameterize your queries, it only has to create the plan ones, right? The plan will already be there and 
it will next time you run it, it will cache the plan. It doesn't have to create the plan anymore. Right? So that's why this thing at the top here, but at the bottom here, you see exactly the query that we had earlier, right? Get between is dot stream, right? That's what we had in the previous thing, right? And then it uh, it, it shows you that. Right, so you have a table view of the results, right? Um, with, uh, what's he's called? Ned, Ned, Tyrion, 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 whatever. And you can also visualize it and render it, right? Uh, by the way, this visualization component of um, any graph, uh, near for j or not, it can kill your machine, yeah. right? So... Uh, you, you should really be careful with that and not be surprised. It's got nothing to do with Neo4j. It's got everything to do with uh, the, the visualization component in your browser, right? It doesn't like it very much when you have too many objects instantiated and then you start to calculate. Uh, oh, in order to visualize this well what we very often do is we calculate the physics between the different objects but guess what it, they start moving around and they start dancing around if i modify one thing here right i don't oh, know actually this one doesn't do that oh you see what happens <laughs> you can't you can't see it it's actually much more spectacular on my screen here but it's it, it starts recalculating the physics and that's when your fan comes on <laughs> right um so no, you can say n node size, uh, here's the page rank and node color, uh, again, page rank, uh, you know, the, you can run these things over here, right? Other things here, degree, you know, all of these things. You also have the, um, the other classes of um, graph algorithms in here. Uh, like for example, the community detection uh, algorithms, right? If I want to run Louvain, over um, uh, the characters with any relationship type in both direction, and I want to show 50 results, then, uh, oh, and now I'm in the rendering tab, which is going to take longer, but anyway, um, it, uh, it, it, it will probably do that, but you can hear my fan. Uh, um, so many of these, so this is very, very, very off topic, but um, the, um, many of these uh, graph algorithms actually talk to your GPU. And uh, if you have things like Zoom running, which also is very, very hungry for your GPU, then they will start biting each other. Uh, Hangouts is another fantastic piece of GPU hogging. Um, that, that it, it, yeah. They start battling for the GPU and then everything starts failing. Um, yeah, yeah. So what's this one here? Um, like for example, uh, Jakar similarity, sim similarity here at the top. Cosine similarity, Pearson similarity, Euclidean similarity. Those are the, the, the algos that are currently in there. The one that we use most so they tell me it's Jakar similarity, but I'm not the expert on this. Um, so is there a packaging system actually for this? Like, can you load somebody else's based on what? Is there like a packaging system? Because you're loading all these in, in your query language, you're yeah. loading all of these algorithms from some library. Yeah. But if I want to use a third party library on this, so yeah, well, there is a packaging system which is called the Neo4j plugins, right? So here in the plugins, right? So if I open this folder, right? I don't know about that, but so what you to comply with our plugin API, right? Uh, so and then then you what you basically create is a jar file. Right? You can see them here, right? These are the this is the graph algorithms jar file that complies with the plugin API and that implements the algos in a certain way, right? Um, these, all of these things are open source. Right? You can, um, Neo4j algo. Go here on GitHub. 
right? You will have all the solid resources, the tests and everything right there. So if you want to fork that and replace something with your own algos, you could do that. Swiss Army Knife. And with power comes responsibility. Still have one book. And I'm not giving it to him. <laughs> um, actually, I think, um, you know, I, we, we could go into this a lot more, but I, um, it feels like we kind of need to wrap up. Um, so the, 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 I hope I've explained the mechanism of it, you know, how you can work it uh, with the plugins, with the cipher queries that, uh, that allow you to call it, but also with the Neuler visualization or UI that allows you to play with it, uh, hopefully a lot more um, interactively. Um, you know, you don't have to go through that entire pipeline time and time again. You can just load the data into the FHA, play with the right algorithm, and I will bet you that you will have to experiment, right? And clustering algorithms, community detection algorithms, similarity algorithms, they give very um, unpredictable results sometimes. And you will have to figure out, based on your data set, your data model, what is the right one for your domain. Um, there's no secret sauce to that in my, in my experience. What, what other algorithms are you planning to release? I can get you that answer, but I don't know that answer. Any chance in social leadership? I can check for you, uh, but I don't know. I don't know the answer. I, I mean, I explained to you in the beginning that this is like a customer-led thing for us, um, so we, we are very much you know interested in learning about it. Um, the what you've seen today, this was built by a very small team. This is like five guys that have built it. And um, we are ramping up that team. You know, we've got a hiring plan and we, we're, we're, we're hiring a lot more resources into it. And we're planning to make much more uh, into it. But it's very much customer led. So if you have a specific example, then. Maybe you can. <laughs> Uh, related to uh, like uh, academics, do you have any plans to make like the professional version available for free? Yeah, we do that. Already. Uh, already, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. There's a. I didn't find the right way to do. <laughs> yeah, if you, it, there's an educational license okay. for the yep. So, uh, in any case, the enterprise version of the FPJ is free for every developer. There's no you know, individual developers, so we work with enterprise version as much as we want. And academics which is literally, you know, when you have a team of researchers working together, taking it a free enterprise uh, um, uh, for the most uh, yeah. uh, What's the most interesting use case you've come across where Neo4j has been learned, uh, has been used in a machine learning context? Um, I mean, how much time do you have? Um, <laughs> no, I mean, there's, I, I, the part of the reason why I'm still at the FJ is because you know there's so many cases like that, right? I give you an example of um, I was talking to you about that about uh, med medical research, pharmaceuticals. There was someone talking to me about. Did you? Yeah. Uh, we don't do any machine learning, but yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I, I the, the the one that I that I really like is uh, is um, UCB here in Belgium. They did this. Um, they they brought out a new piece of Application for osteoporosis, right, which is a you know a, a, a bone disease, right, brittle bones, and uh, that's what, this was a new medicine for them. They didn't know any, they didn't know that market, and if you know anything about pharmaceuticals, that also means that they didn't know the doctors that were prescribing it. They had no idea, right. So what they did um, is uh, what's the name of the guy? Um, there's this one guy, an academic, uh, I think it's a Hungarian. Uh, Erdos. What's that? It's Erdos. Erdos. That's, it's, it, that is the project I'm working on. Oh, fucking hell. But we don't, use, uh, we don't use machine learning. We do more influencer analytics and uh -huh. try to identify influencers. Is that what you're yeah. 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 So what they do is, they, Erdos is, is this Hungarian uh, uh, academic. 
who made it the point of his life to write as many academic papers as he possibly could. And he had like 3,500 papers. And he didn't write all of them, he just got his name on it, right? So, um, but he, he so he got a spider in the graph, right? In all of the academic papers. And so what they did is they analyzed all uh, academic research published around osteoporosis and they were trying to understand, you know, who are the important researchers in this field. So then, instead of the reps, right, the pharmaceutical reps having to visit, I don't know, 2,000 gynecologists in Belgium, all of a sudden there's 60. There's 60 gynecologists that are like the most important guys, and if you get those, the rest will follow. Right? But that's what I was talking about earlier for we did it, they did it for osteoporosis, but also for epilepsy. And for each domain, we build a new database. But this only yeah. example, I mean, you should not do that over beers because it would take a long time. <laughs> but we should all go for beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I hope this was a useful evening for you. I, I know I didn't cover everything you probably wanted me to cover, but I hope it was still useful. And again, you know, you can download all the stuff that I've showed you for free. There's no no costs involved or whatever. And you can uh, put it, take it for a spin and hopefully we'll meet again. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah.